Thank you, everyone. Very good afternoon to all. My name is Hui. I'm the uh, newly minted Director of Investor Relations at East Ventures. For those of you who have not met me, you may not know, but this is my first week officially with East Ventures. <laughs> so there's a tough job, huh? But, um, so while my role at EV is new, um, I really like to say that my relationship with East Ventures is not. I've known the team, many of the team members at the senior level for several years by now. We've worked together in one form or another over the past few years. And so I have the luxury of time to do my due diligence, uh, to understand more about East Ventures and to really build my conviction in the firm. And it's this same level of conviction that we have um, in our founders that really encouraged me um, to, to join the platform. So when the opportunity to join East Ventures arose, um, the decision was quite quick for me. I didn't have to think very hard. You know? To me, I think East Ventures is a leading platform in Southeast Asia, and perhaps uh, one day the world. So um, on that note, I'd like to bring the focus back to our LPs, because I think similarly, our LPs have a lot of conviction in us. Um, while I have four of them with me here today, very like-minded LPs, I want to use this opportunity to also um, thank the rest of the LPs who are not on the stage today due to space and time constraints. You know who you are. We thank you for this, because without your support, we will not be here in this room at Labo Bajo today. So thank you all the LPs. And coming back to our panel today, uh, this morning our panelists were made to go through a very grueling self-introduction. So I decided to spare them from that. I'm going to give a quick round of recaps on what each of them are. So on my left, I have Ms. Jaslyn Vijaya from Cinemas. Um, Jaslyn is one of our longest standing and uh, most loyal LPs. In fact, uh, I think we've been with us for 10 years, right? Um, the extent of their closeness um, can be, can be uh, thought of this way. Uh, Wilson, according to what I hear, has no qualms about asking her to uh, go on meetings with you at 6.30 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, that's, that's how close they are. Right? And next up, we have uh, Sunil, who is partner of Primary Investments at Adam Street Partners, one of the world's uh, most respected global fund of funds, managing over $50 billion in AUM. Now, uh, one fun fact about uh, Sunil, I discovered last night that he has an elephant's memory. He actually knows the names of all of our team members. All, you know, that's like 70 other people. Is that overstatement? <laughs> sure, right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't know who is who, you know, you can consider asking Sunil. And next to Sunil, we have uh, Marcus. Marcus is uh, head of Asia Private Equity from DEG, Europe's leading developmental finance institution. Um, and uh, Imwe mentioned this morning uh, at this session that uh, it's really thanks to DEG that uh, we have really helped, uh, we have really come to uh, refine our thinking and also our practices around ESG. And it's really thanks to Marcus and his team. So thank you. And last but not the least, we have uh, Eduardo, who represents Oppenheimer Generations Asia. Um, I wish to reiterate that this is not the atomic bomb guy, okay? It's nothing to do with the movie. Um, Oppenheimer Generations Asia represents the interests of Nikki and Jonathan um, Oppenheimer, uh, easily one of the most, if not the most influential uh, family from South Africa. So without further ado, let me launch into the discussion today. Um, I'll start with Jaslyn. So Jaslyn, um, as a family-owned business, I want to understand how does uh, investing into venture capital uh, make sense for you? Yeah. And, and given that you've been with us for a long time, uh, and you invested in East Ventures at a time when the market was really nascent, that was 2013. What gave you the conviction to invest into East Ventures? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's really good to be here, and you, I think you found a really good time to join East Ventures a week before La Bola Bajo. So yeah, <laughs> we basically started looking into the sector uh, 10 years ago. That's five years later than uh, Wilson did, or East Ventures did. Uh, so back in 2013, uh, 10 years ago, we really see the growth and potential of the digital and tech startup ecosystem in Southeast Asia and especially Indonesia where we were. And we have also seen how digitalization um, drives innovation, productivity, and economic growth in other regions before that. So we wanted to participate in this growth, both uh, financially as diversification as well as strategically. Um, as some of you may or may not know, I think Sinaramas operate in 
very traditional businesses. Um, we're in food and agri, pop and paper, uh, resources, um, financial services, and property. So uh, my late grandfather believed into entering businesses that will touch um, the ordinary people's daily li uh, life on a daily basis. And I think um, 10 years ago, tech had, and even more so now, become one of those businesses that touch your life on a daily basis. So we wanted to be a part of that. And um, we're also looking uh, beyond financial return. Of, of course, that's important. Um, also looking at new technologies, new startups, um, new companies that will uh, disrupt, enable, and transform our businesses. So uh, that's why we started our venture arm, uh, invest directly and indirectly through funds in uh, the digital space. And that's um, not long after that we met Wilson by coincidence. I think my one of my colleagues ran into him in an elevator. Um, I think as a pioneering uh, VC fund, um, focusing on early stage in Indonesia, they were very well positioned to capitalize on this trend. And, um, you know, Wilson um, at that time, um, I think eventually, it, uh, ultimately, it was a bet on Wilson. Um, we like his decisiveness, his killer and sharp instinct in uh, picking entrepreneurs, as well as I think his uh, long-term, um, very forward-thinking vision in this space. Um, and as he was decisive in picking entrepreneurs, I think we were also as decisive in um, uh, placing a bet on him and his ventures at that time. Uh, we continue to be a long-standing LP, and uh, it's been a long journey and a rewarding one. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And Nick Sunil. So if, if my memory serves me correct, Industry Partners is uh, one of the first, if not the first, global fund of funds to actually have a structured program investing to Southeast Asia venture capital. So uh, even till today, a lot of your peers remain skeptical about the opportunity set in Southeast Asia. So what's, what's different for you? I want to understand how did you build the investment case for, first of all, Southeast Asia back then, and secondly, for East Ventures? So uh, maybe a couple of lines of background. So you know, Adam Street is almost 50 years old now. So we got into this business backing a lot of backing and a lot of people and doing a lot of things that were not done before we did it. So, you know, when we go back to the birth of US venture, you know, we were early investors with all the brand name franchises today. Then we went to Europe, we did that. Then we went to China, we did that. Then we went to India. So Southeast Asia was probably the next frontier. Uh, I would say we were slightly more skeptical uh, because of multiple reasons of the market. Uh, and I would say, I always believe that even if you get a great market, you know, until you don't find the right GP, you can't invest. So, you know, you can get excited about the market, but you need to find the right GP. Because the GP is the person who takes the market potential and makes it an LP return. You know? Otherwise, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in between. So, we were actually looking, and, you know, we had spent a lot of time starting 2012, actually. So, we were very, very early. And luckily, we were in Singapore, and everything was happening around us, so it was easy to stay in touch. Uh, so, we saw a lot of things, and then, uh, we continue to make a case to our IC, global IC, that we think there is a lot happening here. Uh, and we had seen two, two market trends. One was we had seen how mobile had completely changed China in terms of digital adoption and the technology trends that had happened. Then we had seen the same thing happen in India. So we knew that at some stage it was going to happen in Southeast Asia. So we had certain preparedness of mind and some success of pattern recognition of what to do. Uh, and that's why we were kind of, I would say, very astutely looking for the right things to do. So that's why we were early, and we were able to kind of make that call. Thank you, Sunil. Thanks, Dr. Marcus. So as a DFI investor, I'm sure your investment objectives extend beyond uh, financial ones. So what sort of impact uh, are you trying to drive in Southeast Asia, and what makes you, what made you decide to um, select East Ventures as a partner for you on the ground? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we, um, DG is a, is a DFI, uh, Development Finance Institution, and uh, our mandate is to promote private entrepreneurship in emerging markets. So our ultimate goal is to it, uh, improve the living conditions of people in our markets. 
And uh, now the question is, uh, how do we achieve that? So our strategy is called impact, climate, and return. And the return for us matters a lot. So the way we, we as DG, we emphasize that return matters and the commercial, pure commercial investors always emphasize that impact matters for them. But for us, it's really, return is the engine for impact. There is no impact without return. So both go hand in hand, that is super important. So therefore, when we look at an investment, for example, a fund investment, our first look is purely commercial. So we, as every other investor, we look at team, we look at track record performance, we look uh, at governance, and, uh, and then we also look at, at impact. I mean, the good thing about venture capital is um, there is impact is, is already implied uh, in, in our market. There is, uh, venture capital has a huge potential to generate a lot of uh, impact. And um, so what we do is, uh, maybe it would be interesting for the audience to understand how do we measure impact? What act actually do we mean by, by impact? So impact is, there are a couple of categories. One is uh, to create decent jobs. It's, it's not only about jobs, it's, it's really about minimum wages. It's about uh, social aspects. It's about uh, occupa occupational health and safety, for example. Then another uh, impact uh, we measure is, uh, is local income. So that is also local supply chain. So how much uh, income really uh, is kept within the country, uh, within the people living in, in the country. Another one is for example, market uh, development. So uh, our VCs create markets for people which have never existed before. Let, let's talk about financial inclusion as an, uh, as an example. Um, another topic which matters for us is an environmental stewardship. So we very much, uh, let me say, uh, like to see uh, our investors and, and ourselves uh, to promote and invest into themes which also help to mitigate carbon footprints. So we see what's going around in the world, all this, uh, uh, let me say, heat waves, uh, flooding. So I think we need to do something to, to, to protect that. And finally, it's about the community benefits. So, and we heard today also a lot about this. So now your question, how did we end up in East Ventures? So we uh, actually came in in 2021, so only two years ago, we are invested in, uh, in the growth fund too. And um, we as DG only started our venture program in, in, in this region in 2019. So it's not that long, it's just four years that we have been investing here. And we started to look into uh, more regional themes. Uh, and then uh, we were also suddenly, or very quickly, we came across East Venture. And uh, for us, East Venture really fulfilled many, many important criteria, well-established firm, a good track record, uh, and ESG was already deep in their mind. So uh, that was for us a good mixture of, of factors which made it easy for us to uh, come to, a, to the conclusion to invest into uh, East Ventures. Thank you, Marcus. And uh, speaking of impact, I think that's something very close to heart for Eduardo as well um, at uh, Oppenheimer Generations Asia. Um, how do you blend that with the complex mission of creating a very enduring legacy for the family and how does investing to Southeast Asia fit into that grand scheme of things? And why East Ventures? It's like four questions. No. Yeah, I'll try to, I'll try to I'd love to know thank my you, yeah. panel. Thank you so much. And, and thanks for having us here, Wilson and the team. This is a truly magical place. And I know it's been a lot of effort to get here. So thank you. Um, look, I think the reality when you talk about enduring legacy for a family, I mean, the, the family I work for have been operators for 120 years. Uh, in you know oh, real high 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 intensity operational businesses, and um, the way they look at a little bit like we were saying, I mean the way they look at their vision is really they, they want to make profits, but in such a way as to improve the lives of the communities and societies around them. Because if you don't do that, you can't stay in business. You you don't have the license to stay in business. And so, in a way, their ideal is to make 
consistent, sustainable profits forever, rather than extract short-term, you know, excess short-term profits. So I think it's how you how you ensure survival, but also how you how you um, can meaningfully contribute to society. So imagine if you could make a 15% KGAR forever. You know, you'd probably take that over trying to hustle a quick win here and there. So I think that's that's the general approach. I mean, I think for us, um, in terms of um, why we're here, I mean, Singapore and the, the, the Asia operation is really the latest uh, initiative for us as a family office. We set up there two years ago. And the reason for that is we see a, a real strategic uh, objective for us is that we see the growth and the opportunities in, in, in the next century to come in that access of emerging markets between China, India, Southeast Asia, and Africa. We're already in Africa. We're not, we were not in Asia, and it's the opportunity to build that. But it's building that over time, and we understand relationships take a really long time. Uh, it requires you being on the ground. It requires you hopefully being seen as a trusted partner. And uh, we set up two years ago. We built a, a team, and we're trying to find like-minded investors and, and partners to, to help us on that journey. Um, Singapore's our base, but we, we've had a focus on a number of markets. And in terms of YS Ventures, I mean, we've been investors now since 2022, and we really couldn't think of a better partner for us in terms of helping us land in a complex market like, like Indonesia. And it's not just in terms of the great investments that you know that we see through the through the fund and a lot of the people that are here today, maybe in the other room. Um, but I think it's it's also the opportunity to, to learn about a market, which is the people, the culture, the the, 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 the way of the way of doing business. And I think that's kind of how we how we go about it. So it's been a great journey. And I think, as, as Wilson said this morning, it's really like joining a family or a community. It's not really you know a traditional fund in that sense, which is which is great. So I feel the same way too. And, and speaking of family, uh, you, you guys have known us for some time by now. Each of you, have, uh, of course, uh, have, have spent different lengths of time with these ventures. How do you think we have evolved over time alongside the market? Maybe let's start with uh, Justin, since you're the long years oldest LP. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I've been very privileged to see um, the growth and transformation of his ventures in the last 10 years, and it's been really amazing from um, they were in very early stage, and um, Wilson was kind of a one-man show, maybe two or three. <laughs> and now you see, you know, their leadership filling the stage today, right? With uh, with uh, nine partners in here, they used to manage uh, just a few million dollars to now close to two billion dollar fund um, from an, just an early stage fund into an institutionalized platform. They've backed some of the most successful startups. I think at 1.4 out of the five first few unicorns in Indonesia. So I think that has been really amazing. And um, not only have they been recognized as, I guess, one of the top performing um, venture capital fund in this region, I think the their ability to balance, uh, back to your point, right, profit and purpose have been amazing. And their focus on ESG as well and the impact that they drive um, definitely in Indonesia, and if not in the region. So very proud to be part of the family. Thank you. So Leo? Actually, um, you know, I'm just trying to record my first meeting with Wilson, you know. Uh, I was uh, very, very impressed because he, in this business, you know, you see a lot of things, especially a seed investor. And uh, we had a little bit of a, I would say, make-believe disagreement, you know, where I really pushed him very hard. <laughs> But he was very, very clear what he doesn't do, you know, and I think that's very impressive in this business to know exactly what you don't do because then you know what you're going to do. Um, and if I see the journey from that time where a little, little bit after you, know, he had a couple of people, but not a lot of people, and uh, we had a bit of discussion around that that this is just too small for us to do. Um, but you know, it's kind of a full early stage journey, you know, in that sense, he has gone from kind of a seed investment himself. To a unicorn, you know, so you know, the fund is so big now and the team is pretty good. Uh, and he has hired really well. I think the, the, the it's not easy. Uh, one of the issues in this market is quality talent. Uh, first you spot, then you have to attract, then you have to retain, and then you have to develop. And it, I think they've done a really good job. Um, there are multiple funds, so I think, you know, different LPs can come and actually participate as well, which I think is increases the, I would say, the effect of the platform. So really happy with the way he's built the team and how the team has come across. So I think you know all all positive all positive 
uh, I would say elements here. Um, in many sense, it has exceeded our expectation. We we expected it would take longer to get various various cotton, but it's all in a all in good way. In that sense, I would say um, you know comparing to the market, I think you know definitely they are ahead of the market in terms of their own development, you know, which is kind of good, uh, which is not surprising as well because you know they had disproportionate market share of wind, which was one of the things that really excited us. You know, so we like the market, then we find a GP who is disproportionately winning the market. So, you know, that's what kind of got us really excited and continues to be the case. So, lots of hard work still to go, but well done. I was going to say that uh, you drive him hard, he drives us pretty hard too. <laughs> Marcus, over to you. Yeah, we uh, joined the uh, EV family just two years ago, so it's a, it's a young relationship. Um, but uh, so far, we have experienced a very nice journey with uh, EV, and uh, we as an LP try to add value where we can. And we as a DFI, if not us, uh, we of course see our core competency in uh, ESG, so our focus here is mainly on Avina. So we really are in, in very uh, intensive exchange with her. And we have started a couple of initiatives. One is, for example, when we came in, we developed together with the fund uh, an uh, environmental and social management tool. As we call it ESMS. And we hired a consultant to set it up. So actually, it's a, it's a, it's a tool to measure ESG risk in each and every investment, and that's built into their investment process. So every investment they are doing will be checked, not only commercially, but also on with respect to ESG. Then they um, do a gap analysis with each and every investee, and then, of course, there are always gaps to standards we expect, and then uh, a part of this is also to develop an action plan which needs to be implemented and, and executed. Another example is that we um, also supported a social and labor audit with one of the portfolio company which is in Agritech, a, a, a larger one. And uh, the, the latest, most recent, I think, initiative is where we hired a um, very well-known uh, consultant to come up with a uh, decarbonization framework. So how to measure greenhouse gas emissions with each and every portfolio company. And that is in particular in the light of the newest baby of the group, uh, the, the climate fund, that, that's very important. But of course our expectation is that this tool will be also used in their core, other core businesses. So this really helps to measure carbon emission and, and, and also to, to be sensible and probably to come up with action plans how to mitigate carbon emissions. So that is another field where the fund can add a lot of value to its investees. Thank you. Awada? Yeah, look, um, I'm also still new to the party, so obviously still early to tell. To, no, but I think what, what, is, what has struck me, I mean, I don't know how many of you have, have had the presentation from Wilson with the, the cards. And I think that, I mean, starting from that and looking at how this has evolved, I think, you know, the reality is that what's core to the DNA is the, the deep knowledge and access to the market of, of, of getting access to good companies and great companies today, but also a bit of that intuition of what's going to come next and how do we pivot, how is the economy going to change. I think what you're seeing that here in terms of the, the latest cycle, at least from when we've been investors, you see that DNA is still strong, but then this ability to think about and pivot into new whether it's you know, consumer lifestyle trends, like the previous panel we just saw, is just thinking about new ways of responding to consumers or things around, I mean, there's a, I don't know, precision medicine and a few investments you made in that space, in diagnostics to, um, you know, so just to the tools that, you know, folks at the conference here right now. And I think it's, it's that ability to think ahead and make some bets and, and, and see how, how it plays out. Obviously, we're all here on the same boat and it'll be interesting to see what works and what doesn't, but I think it's that, that core approach and, and the agility and speed to act on conviction, I think, is, is really important. Now I'd like to bring the um, focus of the discussion back to our startups, our popular companies. Uh, we have a group of our founders in the other room, and I'm sure they also would like to hear from you guys. Um, right now, the, the issue that's front and center for everyone is really the startup funding winter. 
So what are each of your observations on, on, on this, um, what's happening right now? And how do you think LPs can play a role in, in supporting our startups through this funding venture? Maybe we start off with Eduardo. Sure. <laughs> I, I, we talk about this. I actually, I don't know if there is a funding winter in the, in, in, in the fuller sense, right? Obviously, raise, funding has gone down. No, no, it has gone down, right? But there's also like so much dry powder waiting in the wings and a lot of pent up capital was raised in the last cycles. A lot of funds are still deploying. A lot of allocators are waiting in the wings, right? So, you know, how do you, how do you measure that? I mean, to me, the, the reality is if I'm sitting here as a fund, founder, I'd be saying, okay, look, there is still a lot of capital. There may be higher bar or higher risk, uh, you know, higher, lower risk appetite, but at the end of the day, the objective is still the same. It's the big picture is, you know, the objective is to try to build a long-term you know, business, a fantastic business that can stand the test of time. And how do I do that? How do I get away from short-term valuation cycles and fear of a down round in the short term and look past that to see where do I want to go in the next 5, 10, 15 years? And what kind of partners do I need on that journey? I think from our side, I mean, look, all of us have different strengths and in different regions, but at the end of the day, hopefully trying to be a good long-term partners in terms of capital, uh, patient capital into these founders over time, and then where possible, try to add some operational expertise or connections to, to our network to see how we can help them scale. And initially, it might be a bit of you know, belts and braces, getting through this cycle, and in some cases, it may be sort of um, feeding the growth, but I think that's the, I would, basically, I, I would be cautious and prudent, but I wouldn't panic. Uh, I think there's still a lot of capital uh, waiting to be won. Um, but I don't know if you guys agree or not. Yeah, I, I think in, this is a, in general, this is a concern uh, to, the, to the entire industry. But we all know every winter is followed by a spring and then comes summer. Uh, and there will be, the, we, are, we are in cycles. So what, how to deal with the situation? I mean, for us, it's most important to pick the best fund managers. And for the fund managers, the only way is to pick the best investees and to advise the investees how to weather the storm, what to do keeping cash tight, uh, thinking about how aggressively to grow versus burning money. And, and uh, what we have heard today is that this firm is on, on a very good track and, and, and working very closely with, with entrepreneurs, which are still young, which is good, and have probably experienced less storms. And therefore, it's good to have partners like, like, like East Ventures uh, to, to help. and uh, and. Let me say the most important is to survive, and, and, and after after the storm, the weak trees fall over, but the strong uh, trees are still standing, and and came come out stronger of, of, of this. So, I think I, I agree with you. There is there's no need to be super pessimistic, but I think we all need to be very concerned and and, and, and careful. I think though. The, the motto of the conference, you know, the prudent, I think, you know, that probably is the most important word here. Uh, one thing that uh, founders should keep in mind is that, you know, if East Ventures back to you're probably the best of the crop, okay? And, uh, you know, market which is tough, you know, I think the, the, the strong guys actually, actually get disproportionate win there. So you gotta be, you gotta be open-minded, you gotta remain positive on that. Uh, and as I already said, I think, if you compare this market to say the 2000 dot com burst, the dry powder is a lot. There's a lot of capital sitting on the sideline and waiting for the right opportunities. But you know, everybody is scrutinizing more, asking more questions. So a little bit of easy money is gone, but the money is there. Okay, so you gotta build muscle to be able to access that and never waste prices, you know. You can build great capability here. Some of the best companies that we think of today, you know, all the great Banks that we talk about, they all came from crisis actually. So they got started or they got built during that time. This is the time where you know nobody is throwing money in at you, so you know you have time to build. And the only thing you have to tell is that the valuation of lift might not happen every quarter, but that's okay. You know, twelve month is fine. So I think that's the way to look at it. I think uh, you will come through this because there is capital. The second part is that the digital, because of COVID globally, is very real. I think now we see a very broad swath of investors doing this. So it just doesn't need to be us, you know, the corporates are doing it, families are doing it, traditional businesses are doing it. So, you know, everybody's kind of open to 
investing. There can be non-conventional investors who might be open-minded. So just keep an open mind about where to look for the capital. Yeah, I tend to agree with uh, Eduardo. I'm sure there's a tech funding winter, but for us, we see this as an opportunity, right? I think uh, without the um, good and uh, uh, not, not so good companies, and whoever uh, will be able to withstand this time will emerge stronger, right? So I think for us, we see this as an opportunity to enter and even double down on the best performing companies, uh, on the best performing funds as well, right? Um, and I think it's also a chance for the, on, for, uh, for the entrepreneurs to actually focus on you know, the business, the operation, the business model, um, instead of, you know, chasing valuation, right, at the same time. And, you know, while there's a tech winter uh, for our traditional businesses, we've had a um, uh, summer last year, so we're definitely open to um, investing in a good, uh, really good companies. And so to our founders in the other room, you know who to call. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, we do are trying to catch the um, sunset, you know, so this uh, has uh, compressed our time today. Uh, so before we wrap up, I'd like to um, hear from each of our LPs on uh, Gems of Wisdom. This is really borrowing a page from um, In Waste Playbook. Do you have any uh, Gems of Wisdom for either ourselves or for the seller founders? Maybe I'll start soon. I'd like to throw you the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have any gems of wisdom. You know, I think uh, for for all the founders, I guess you know, uh, I know that these are really smart people, and to to get through the EV test, you know, I know Wilson. Uh, you know, luckily he once brought me to a founder meeting as well, so I know how how tough they are. So so if you got through that, you know, you have already you know higher probability of success, and then you have this great team which is kind of backing you and this ecosystem benefit that, that accrue to you. So I think you're in the life is all about probability. So you have very high probability of success. And in this is a startup game, you know, even with all the probability, there are might be situations where it might not work, but it's okay. You know, there is this repeat founder, you know, a stereotype here. So you know you can actually try it again. Uh, but the opportunity is real, you know, the digitization is real. So I think you know we are all excited about that, you know, and I can say that for many LPs because uh, we, get, we get a lot of other LPs who are looking to invest in this region. They call us for reference and I think the interest is pretty real. So, so just build, build for the future. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I can offer just wisdom, but I, I think just one of the things that you know always strikes me is just how hard a founder's job is already. And then you're asked to think about uh, you know, valuation and go back to like increasingly detailed DD processes with us. You asked about ESG frameworks, you asked about, you know, all sorts of things, right? You have to speech of it. So I think the, the, the main thing, especially in the cycle, is really just going back to basics, right? So why did you get into this product? It's to solve a really pressing challenge that you saw and, and to delight customers, right? And at the end of the day, what it comes down to is probably building a sustainable business that will, last the that will stand the test of time. And I think in this process, as we go through it, it's it's really just going back to that mission of what got you started, how, you know, what is mission critical, and how do you manage through by minimizing distractions. And if it's gonna, you know, whatever thing comes in, you know, if it's gonna meet your objective, great. Otherwise, it's tripping out the noise and, you know, staying focused on what, what that mission is. I think, at the end of the day, you will know more than anyone else what got you into this and, and what will make it successful. I think it's just following your heart and your conviction to to just get past this this cycle. No specific advice from my side. I can only congratulate the founders. They have picked the right region here in Indonesia. So I was a little bit depressed when earlier today the gross numbers were put on the on the board, and I saw Europe was far behind. So we are happy if we have one percent GDP growth, and here we're talking five to six percent GDP growth. So this is an attractive uh, region. Uh, just uh, continue being here. But we also heard on the previous panel, sometimes it's also good to look beyond uh, ASEAN. Uh, but yeah, keep your discipline and keep your passion uh, with, with what you're doing. That's the only general advice I can give. Yeah, I don't know. I think they're all wiser than me as well. <laughs> but I guess I would say, um, there's always an opportunity behind every crisis, so 
during this time, please look at uh, what is your uh, you know, longer term vision and what is the opportunity uh, behind this stuff. Right? So I think um, I come to the conclusion that our LPs are, are really, really patient and also very generous. Um, they share a lot of insights with us and more importantly, I think um, they, they are giving a lot of encouragement, not just to, to us as fund managers, but also to our popular companies. So we want you to know that you have our support. Focus on the right thing, do the right thing, and we are here for you. Right. With that, I'd like to bring this panel to a close, and let's give it up for our panel. Thank you. Thank you to our moderator and all panelists for our second panel discussion of the day. Please remain on stage for a little bit as I'd like to invite Mr. Wilson Chuacha, co-founder and managing partner at Ease Ventures, to give a token of appreciation to our panelists, followed by a photo session. Gentlemen, let's give another round of big applause to all our speakers today and of course to all of you.